Trial is a project funded by the European Union under the Justice Program 2014-2020 and led by the Center of Judicial Cooperation, CJC of the European University Institute, which is also the organizer of today's event. The project has its own webpage in the website of CJC and there you can find the complete list of the partners to the project, which includes uh, universities, research institutes, judicial schools and a national bar association for a total of 10 member states represented. In the website, you can also find a presentation video of the project by Professor Gabor Almay, uh, who is a trial scientific coordinator. Today, an overview of the project's activities and of the tools that we will realize within trial is provided by my colleagues, Maria Vittoria Catanzariti and Madalina Moral, my colleagues from the CJC. I take this occasion to thank them for the organization of this series of free webinar connected to trial. And this is the first actually of free webinars. I also um, remind to all participants that until the Q&A session, you will see only the panelists. And then for the Q&A uh, session, we will uh, become all uh, visible. And I recall to the panelists that they have to speak um, in a slow way because this uh, webinar is recorded. And the reason why it is recorded is because it will uh, become one of the tools that will be uploaded in the forthcoming trial online training platform. And on this, I give the floor first to Maria Vittoria to present the project and then to Madalina to present one of the most important tools within the project, which is the trial database. Thank you, Nicole, for uh, the kind uh, invitation and the kind introduction. And uh, let me uh, say just a few words about our ongoing activities. Trial project started one year ago, and we are in the midst of uh, working package three and four. And uh, we are happy, really happy to have uh, all of you very committed in uh, all that we have done so far, um, especially um, I have to mention the CJC database, which is uh, one of the most effort, <laughs> important efforts of a CJC uh, Center uh, for Judicial Cooperation. Um, and uh, it is uh, really um, the results of all your efforts in putting together um, our case sheets uh, uh, of uh, our uh, different national levels and um, also other uh, materials. And uh, the aim of the CJC uh, and uh, also of Nicole and uh, other uh, partners is to make materials for legal practitioner friendly in a way uh, that uh, these materials and uh, all our um, commitments for training are in a sense useful and helpful for legal professional. So this is the aim of these three webinars, uh, which are scheduled for the 28th of January, the 18th of February and the 18th of March, possibly to be confirmed at a certain stage. And um, also of the um, other materials which will be included in the online platform of the project, such as the case book under the responsibility of Maastricht University, as well as the online uh, courses, uh, which uh, will be uh, finalized in working package five. I don't waste much time uh, for the other speakers and uh, I really wish you all uh, good entertainment with our uh, first webinar and uh, I give the floor again to Nicole. Nicole, thank you very much. Thank you Maria Vittoria, but I will immediately give the floor to Madalina for the presentation of the trial database. Thank you very much, Nicole, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, and let me very briefly introduce to you the database that has been developed by the Center for Judicial Cooperation. The database uh, includes around 150 judgments, all on the use of the EU Charter. And of these 150 judgments, 50 case notes have been very uh, recently uh, uploaded 
um, under the five areas that are covered by the trial project. That is mutual trust, uh, rule of law, judicial independence, impartiality, accountability of legal professions. So what is specific about the database um, developed by the Center for Judicial Cooperation with the help of the uh, project partners? Uh, it offers the full uh, life cycle of a case, meaning it includes the final judgment at the national level. It then also includes uh, summaries of the judgments from the Court of Justice of the European Union or the European Court of Human Rights, as well as the implementation of these judgments by national courts. Therefore, um, in the database, we are interested not on purely national cases, but on cases that have a connection with European Union law. And also um, there is a use of judicial interaction form, meaning that the case notes that we summarize, they refer to jurisprudence delivered by foreign domestic courts or by the European supranational courts. I have to emphasize that the database is freely accessible. Uh, and as you can see from the screen, uh, from, uh, from the share screen, uh, it is located on the website of the Center for Judicial Cooperation. Uh, I'll now show you a very brief glimpse of what you can find inside of the database. Um, you can see that the cases that we have collected within the framework of the trial project, they're all located on the top folder there. And we have clustered these cases, which so far are only around 50, but we plan throughout this year to upload at least 50 more judgments. And they're clustered, as you can see here, by areas of law, like I've mentioned, the five uh, areas that are covered by the trial project, as well as by countries. Uh, of course, this uh, is also an um, interactive tool, meaning that you can also use the geography so that uh, you can search here as well. Um, and to give you a full, uh, just a very, very short glimpse here, it's an example of a case that will also be discussed later on uh, by one of my colleagues and one of the speakers, Alexandra. And you can find very brief information of the legal issues, but also the EU legal sources that are used by the national judgments, the legal issues, summary of the reasoning of the court, as well as how the national court has used the EU charter and judicial interaction techniques. At the bottom, you'll find um, reference to the full text of the judgment that is in the original language. And all this information can be downloaded in the PDF uh, format uh, up, uh, above on the top right uh, corner of the web page. Uh, with this, I would like to invite you to follow and use the trial database in your daily work. And if you have any questions regarding the cases or the database, please feel free to write us at the Center for Judicial Cooperation. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll pass the floor now back to Nicole to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madalina. Thank you for this presentation of the database and I clearly endorse your uh, invitation to use the database, which is already very rich and it will become richer and richer in the uh, coming uh, months. So we can move now to the um, topic of today's webinar, which concerns the implication of uh, rule of law deficiencies in a member state on the cooperation between the judicial authority from that member state and the judicial authority of another member state. And the topic of this webinar is connected to the um, transnational workshop that will be hosted clearly virtually but my university, the University of Firenze in, um, in May, late in May 2021. So this is the reason why uh, I was invited today to uh, chair this uh, webinar. So the topic of the workshop that will be held in virtually held in Florence uh, um, is rule of law and mutual trust in the area of freedom, security and justice. And this is uh, also the topic that basically we discuss uh, today. Now for today's event, we chose the title mutual trust and the rule of law behind and beyond the LM case. 
as you all probably know, the LM judgment of 2018 is a leading case of the Court of Justice concerning, I would say, but the modalities of cooperation between national courts and the limits to this cooperation when the request to execute a European arrest warrant comes from a member state where there are rule of law problems. So the Court of Justice established a duty not to execute a European arrest warrant when two conditions are satisfied. So first, in the member state from where the uh, request of execution comes, there are systemic or generalized deficiencies compromising the independence of the national judiciary. And second, there are substantial grounds for believing that the surrender of the requested person will expose her to a real risk of violation of the right to an independent tribunal as guaranteed by Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Importantly, the Court of Justice also established the precise duties of cooperation between the judicial authorities involved with a view to uh, gather all the necessary information to determine whether the European arrest warrant must be executed or not. Our first speaker will go behind the LM judgment, offering um, an overview of the national, notably the Polish background to the case and so a Polish perspective of the case. By contrast, the second and third speakers will go beyond the LM case of the Court of Justice, discussing its application in Italy, and then a Slovenian judgment concerning another field where mutual trust is really important, asylum and migration. So today's first speaker is Martin Mihalak from the University of Gdansk. And in his presentation, Martin will consider the perspective of the Polish judiciary in order to highlight the potential opportunities, but also the threats related to the two-step test introduced by the Court of Justice in the LM judgment. So Martin, I give you the floor. You have 15 minutes and I remember to speak slowly. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, of course, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak at, at today's session. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Professor Konsevich, who was uh, originally scheduled to speak here today, but, but I will do my best to, to replace, to substitute him uh, as good as I can. Uh, but uh, to the point, as probably most of you know it very well, LM was, is a Polish national and uh, he was subjected to three European arrest warrants issued by Polish court for the purpose of prosecuting him for uh, trafficking drugs. And uh, after being arrested, uh, he did not con consent to his surrender, uh, stating that uh, um, on account of the reforms of the Polish system of justice, he runs a real risk of not receiving a fair trial in Poland. And uh, as I pondered which aspect of this LM case to address today, uh, I found out that what, what really raised, a, let's say, stir among uh, European law scholars and commentators was this issue of two-step examination that should be carried out by the court before uh, surrendering a specific person under the European arrest warrant, which Nicole mentioned, these two step examination. And uh, many commentators have criticized this approach by the court. And for me, a kind of symbol of these views was a text written by uh, Professor Kim Lane Chapelle from, from Princeton University. So in her text, rule of law retail and rule of law wholesale, uh, the court alarming Selmer decision, she uh, has stated that from her perspective, this two-step examination in uh, um, circumstances of the case uh, is the point where the court failed spectacularly. And uh, the question is why she thinks so. So in her text, uh, Professor Chapelle pointed out that, um, a quote, when the whole judiciary is the problematic institution, then a case-by-case -case assessment does not work. 
So, and uh, what I found particularly interesting was that to illustrate this situation, she gave the example of the American blues song lyrics, where there is written that ain't a nobody here but us chickens. And she said that the song references to an episode involving a chicken thief who was confronted by a farmer checking uh, his birds in the night. And when the farmer asked the chickens whether there was a thief among them, the thief, of course, invisible in the darkness, answered, ain't nobody here but us chickens. And uh, for Professor Schäppele, this, of course, was demonstrating that you can't trust a chicken under stress. Uh, uh, worse yet, the very fact that the chicken speaks at all may be a sign of trouble. Uh, of course, it, it, it's obvious. But uh, what she said later, quote, if judges in Poland are not independent, would you trust the judge issuing the European arrest warrant to say so? Ain't nobody here but us chicken, says the Polish judge, uh, end of quote. So uh, I think that this comparison really appeals to imagination, yes? So, um, so the argument was mainly speaking that uh, the right thing to do by the court was to deny the status of issuing judicial authority to all Polish courts, uh, what would, which would lead to, to a general uh, rejection of European arrest warrants issued by all Polish courts. And uh, I, I'm sure that from certain perspective, such a solution could be interesting, but I think that some doubts, at least some doubts, arise on the basis of the recent judgment of the court of 17th December 2020 in joint cases C uh, 354 and uh, 20 and uh, 412 20 in open bar ministry. Uh, so in this judgment, in this judgment, the court indicated that Daniel of the status of the issuing judicial authority to all Polish courts, to all Polish courts, which would lead to the general rejection of the European arrest warrants, would have other very significant consequences. And the court said especially that it would imply that the courts of the member state would no longer be able to submit references to the court for preliminary rulings. And I believe that this is quite important and interesting point in the whole discussion. Because as there is no doubt that the actions of the Polish authorities led to the almost complete destruction of the Constitutional Tribunal, that the National Council of Judiciary uh, is, not more, uh, is no longer independent, that the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court cannot be regarded as an independent court anymore, but still, it is not so easy to destroy the ethos and independence of ordinary judges adjudicating in hundreds of Polish courts. Uh, I'm sure that even sir, uh, one of these judges uh, is listening to us, as I believe. So these judges need tools need tools, especially such as a reference for preliminary ruling and therefore a strong voice of the court in the cases where they refer for such a ruling. And it is absolutely necessary for them to be able to act against the abuses of legislative and executive powers in Poland. So recognition of the general suspension of the European uh, arrest warrant mechanism and the exclusion of the possibility of referring question for a preliminary, preliminary ruling uh, could, in my opinion, significantly weaken this, this important group of Polish judges who are individuals who still maintain their independence. And it is, it is quite important. So a lot of Polish judges need the support of the European Union in the fight to ensure the rule of law in Poland is observed. So these courts are an ally of, of um, 
the EU institutions in the struggle for the rule of law in Poland. So to the large extent, they are not a thief shouting at night, ain't nobody here but us chickens, but they are people who need tools, such as uh, reference for preliminary ruling to fight effectively against the abuses of other branches of power. So both a steadily increasing number of uh, preliminary ruling references by Polish courts and examples of number of judgments uh, that evidence judicial independence shows that Polish judicial system is not completely destroyed yet. So just to give a, an example, the administrative court in Warsaw ruled on September 15, 2020, that the prime minister, that the Polish prime minister decision to instruct uh, Poczta Polska, which is a national postal agency, to prepare a correspondence vote during presidential election on May the 10th was invalid and grossly violated the law. I think that this judgment is just a, it's a symbol and one of the judgments showing that the, the, there are still a lot of independent judges in the Polish justice system and there are still uh, a place to support them. So I would like my statement to be well understood. I'm far from making definite judgments and opinions. I just want to point out that the problem is very complex. Uh, the court uh, cautious approach by applying this two tile or two level test means that the Polish judiciary is not treated as a not independent collectively. And this may help independent judges in their fight for the rule of law in Poland. So uh, on the other hand, there are certainly situations in which one tire test uh, would be sufficient. That is true, for example, in, a, uh, in connection with the constitutional tribunal judgments or the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. And of course, I realize that for, for judges from other member states, it may be difficult to nuance the specifics of the various police courts. And I have no simple answer to this problem. I just want to point out that a significant part of Polish judiciary is a full ally of the EU in the fight for the rule of law in Poland. And that categorical one-sided solution may be harmful to these judges. In, in particular, if they won't be uh, entitled anymore to refer for preliminary rulings. Uh, so uh, I would like this speech to just signal some problems, which may be difficult to notice outside of the Polish context, and at the same time to be a contribution to the discussion on the advantages and disadvantages of the so-called two-level test mentioned in the Alam ruling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcin, and thank you for this uh, rich and also passionate um, presentation. I, I just say that I uh, share your critique to the critique, and I think that the Court of Justice in the LM judgment realized um, a difficult balance, but the important thing is that the Court of Justice uh, allowed to keep a channel open between national courts and the Court of Justice, and also between different, uh, between national courts of different member states. And you use the expression um, allies. So you say that uh, at least a part of um, the Polish judiciary uh, is an ally of the Court of Justice. And we know that the um, preliminary ruling is one of the cornerstones of the European legal order because it realizes an alliance between the Court of Justice and national courts. And I share the idea that it is really important to safeguard particularly this channel of um, cooperation. So now we move to another member state, Italy. Uh, because clearly the uh, LM judgment uh, is relevant for all the member states, so notably for the member states which, in which national courts must execute uh, European arrest warrants coming from 
Poland, but also from other member states in which there can be rule of law uh, problems. And the um, Supreme Court of Cassation, the Italian Supreme Court of uh, Cassation, um, already delivered some judgments concerning the application in Italy of the uh, LM uh, judgment. So some sort of indirect follow-up of the uh, LM uh, judgment. And Alessandra Favi will explain us the evolution, if there is an evolution in the approach of the Cassation Court vis-a-vis uh, -vis the LM case. Please, Alessandra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicole. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, just a moment, I will share my presentation. Yes. Okay. It is coming. Yes. yes. Now we can see okay. it. You can perfect. see it. Okay, yes. perfect. Go okay. ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, in my presentation, I will deal with uh, three judgments uh, where the Italian Supreme Court of Cassation uh, engaged with the application of the LM uh, judgment of the Court of Justice. Uh, these judgments were delivered by the Supreme Court uh, criminal section uh, between 2018 and 2020 and concerned the execution by the Italian authorities of several uh, European arrest warrants uh, issued by Polish authorities. Uh, these cases catch the approach adopted so far by the Court of uh, Cassation uh, when dealing with uh, the alleged violation of the right to a fair trial as enshrined in Article 47 of the Charter on grounds of uh, rule of law deficiencies in the issuing member state. Uh, the circumstances that gave rise to um, these judgments are uh, very similar. First, uh, concerning the uh, judgment of uh, 2018, uh, it originated from uh, an appeal brought by um, before the Supreme Court uh, by a Polish citizen uh, for the annulment of a decision um, issued by the Court of Appeal of Bologna uh, to execute a European arrest warrant against uh, the applicant. Uh, one of the applicants' arguments was that the Court of Appeal disregarded uh, the principle uh, set out in the LM judgment of the Court of Justice. Uh, according to the applicant, uh, the Court of Appeal did not apply the principle requiring uh, the Italian authorities to refrain from executing uh, an European arrest warrant when the person concerned um, is in danger of uh, uh, a breach of uh, uh, its fundamental right to a fair uh, trial uh, in the issuing member state. Um, the Court of Cassation uh, rejected the appeal as unfounded. Uh, at the outset of uh, its reasoning, the, uh, court, uh, the Supreme Court uh, summarized uh, the main points of the LM judgment and found that the Court of Appeal of Bologna uh, correctly applied the um, uh, EU law as interpreted by uh, the Court of Justice. Uh, notably, the uh, Court of Appeal correctly stated that uh, the applicant was not uh, was not able to, um, to show a clear link between the uh, systemic problems uh, existent in uh, Poland and uh, the existence of a um, concrete and uh, personal risk of uh, violation of the right to an independent court of uh, the uh, person concerned. Um, he, um, the applicant rather presented generic allegations uh, without proving uh, sufficient information. Furthermore, uh, according to the course of cassation, uh, the simple quotation of the LM judgment uh, by the applicant uh, was not sufficient to trigger the, um, the scrutiny by the national court of the existence of of a risk of a breach of the fundamental right to a fair trial um, in the issuing member state. Um, concerning the second judgment, 
uh, the judgment of 2019, uh, it concerned an appeal uh, raised um, always um, again uh, before the Court of uh, Cassation uh, by a Polish citizen uh, for the annulment of a decision of um, the Court of Appeal of Milano um, to execute a European arrest warrant issued by Poland against the uh, applicant. Um, the applicant claimed uh, that uh, the Court of Appeal failed to uh, recognize that if returned to Poland, he would risk a breach of his right to a fair trial uh, due uh, to the recent reforms undertaken by Poland. Um, moreover, the applicant also claimed that uh, the Court of Appeal failed to request additional information from the Polish authorities in order to assess the risk of breach of his fundamental right. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, found the appeal inadmissible. Uh, notably, it held that uh, the Court of Appeal correctly applied uh, the LM judgment of the Court of Justice. Uh, it then uh, confirmed uh, the findings of the Court of, um, of Appeal and stated that the executing judicial authority cannot refrain from executing an European arrest warrant solely on the basis of generic allegations concerning generalized deficiencies in the judicial system of the issuing member state. In fact, in principle, uh, the executing authorities must verify whether there are substantial grounds for believing that uh, the person will run a risk of uh, a breach of his fundamental right to a fair trial in the issuing member state. However, in the case at stake, um, the applicant uh, did not present any evidence uh, to substantiate uh, his claim, and therefore there was no need to request any additional information and to the Polish authorities. Thus, according to the Supreme Court, uh, the Court of Appeal correctly applied the judgment in LM. Um, finally, in the judgment of May 2020, uh, the Supreme Court was called to rule uh, on an appeal uh, brought by a Polish citizen uh, against the decision issued uh, by uh, the Court of Appeal of Venice and concerning the execution of an European arrest warrant against uh, the uh, applicant. Uh, for the first time, uh, the Court of Cassation declared the appeal well-founded and annulled the judgment of uh, the Court of Appeal of Venice, referring the case again to, the, uh, to that lower court and requesting uh, from uh, it a more careful analysis of the rule of law situation in Poland. Uh, the applicant um, in particular claimed that uh, the, vi the violation of Article uh, 6 of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights and of Article 47 of the Charter. Uh, and according to the applicant, uh, the Court of Appeal did not correct apply um, the LM judgment because it did not take into account the most recent judicial reforms um, uh, in Poland and did not consider the uh, relevant documents um, issued by the Venice Commission. Thus, the applicant concluded that uh, the Court of Appeal failed to consider the risk of a breach of his right to a fair trial if he were returned to Poland. Uh, the Court of Cassation started its reasoning by recalling the key points of the LM judgment and of its previous case law, uh, stressing that the executing state cannot refrain from executing an European arrest warrant solely on the basis of generic allegations of deficiencies in the judicial uh, system uh, of the issuing member state. Uh, the Court of Appeal had found that the applicant had not attached specific elements proving the risk of a breach of his fundamental right to a fair trial. However, unla uh, unlike its previous uh, judgments, the Court of Cassation stressed that after the LM judgment, the situation in Poland has, uh, had further deteriorated due to a series of uh, judicial reforms. 
the Supreme Court recalled the judgments of the Court of Justice in the infringement proceedings um, brought by the Commission against Poland uh, to stress the uh, impairment of the judicial independence in that member state. Uh, it then concluded that in light of the new elements arising um, in Poland after the judgment of the Court of Appeal uh, of Venice, uh, the matter needed to be um, re-examined by that lower court. Uh, it also stressed that the applicant in any case should attach specific uh, and concrete information concerning the impact and the consequences uh, on his criminal proceedings of the recent uh, legislation adopted in Poland. Um, some conclusion can then be drawn from uh, these uh, judgments, both as regards the role uh, of the LM judgment in the uh, legal reasoning of the Court of Cassation and uh, its uh, concrete application in the cases brought before the Supreme Court, uh, the Italian Supreme Court. Uh, concerning the le legal reasoning of the uh, Court of Cassation, firstly, uh, the Italian Supreme Court uh, widely uh, relies on the case law of the Court of Justice in order to um, assess the correctness of the reasoning of the uh, Court of Appeal. Um, it quotes in its judgments uh, entire paragraphs of the uh, rele uh, relevant uh, rulings of the Court of Justice um, to underline the passages that national courts are called to uh, undertake when confronted with uh, the execution of an European uh, arrest warrant um, issued by a member state which presents um, problems with, uh, the rule of, with the rule of law. Uh, secondly, uh, we can uh, see uh, an evolution in the approach of the Supreme Court. Um, in the judgments of uh, 2018 and uh, 2019, uh, the Supreme Court did not put into questions, uh, did not put into question the Court of, Appe of Appeals um, reasoning concerning uh, the rule of law deficiencies in Poland. Uh, by contrast, in uh, the judgment of 2020, um, the Supreme Court uh, stressed um, that the rule of law situation in, the, in that member state um, has been worsening since the um, Court of Appeal uh, judgment. Um, in this last judgment, um, it emerges uh, um, a more careful um, analysis by the Supreme Court of the recent case law of uh, the Court of Justice and of the uh, judicial reforms undertaken by Poland. Uh, thirdly, uh, in its three uh, judgments, the, the Supreme Court did not did not consider necessary um, to send a preliminary uh, ruling to uh, preliminary reference to the Court of Justice. Um, notably, in the uh, judgment of 2020, uh, the Supreme Court stressed that uh, there was no need to raise questions for preliminary ruling, uh, since it limited uh, itself to assess whether uh, EU law, as interpreted by the Court of Justice, was correctly applied by um, the uh, Court of Appeal. Uh, concerning uh, the concrete application of the LM judgment, um, um, in the cases uh, at stake, um, the main difficulties uh, seem to arise as regards the uh, burden of proof and the role of national courts in collecting uh, evidences relating to rule of law deficiencies in the issuing member state. Uh, first, we can infer from um, the judgment of 2020 that uh, the ruling of the Court of Justice in infringement procedures against Poland uh, can be relevant in order to prove the generalized and systemic deficiencies in the issuing member state. Um, second, um, in the two judgments of 2018 and 2019, the Supreme Court stressed that the Court of Appeal correctly found that it that it is for the applicant to attach concrete circumstances justifying the link between the, gener the generalized deficiencies um, in the issuing member state and uh, individualized risk of breach of his right to, a, um, to a indi an independent court. 
only if the applicant has satisfied that burden of proof, uh, the national authorities may, might be required to ask additional information to the issuing member state. Um, against this background, uh, what seems to uh, get lost is the um, spirit of cooperation between national authorities of different uh, member states. Uh, indeed, in DLM judgment, uh, the Court of Justice at, um, attached great importance uh, to the dialogue between the um, national authorities of uh, the different member states uh, as the only way to uh, fill the lack of um, adequate uh, information in the executing member state. That, that aspect uh, seems um, to uh, take a marginal role uh, in the Italian judgments. Uh, this is a limit of the approach of the Italian Court of Cassation. Also considering that in the uh, LM judgment, the Court of Justice um, expressly uh, stated uh, that the, uh, the correct assessment of the risk for the individual concerned uh, might depend on any objective material concerning the conditions for protecting the guarantee of judicial independence that the issuing member state can provide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Alessandra Fabi is from the University of Firenze. So yes. we, are, uh, uh, we are colleagues from Florence. I think I didn't mention this before, so I beg your pardon, uh, Alessandra. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. I think it's very interesting to see this increasing en engagement of the Court of Cassation with the uh, LM uh, case law. Um, at the same time, as you um, pointed out, it's a pity that the um, uh, lower courts are not uh, using this uh, possibility and actually they're not uh, observing this real duty of cooperation with the authorities of another member state with, uh, the, um, on which the Court of Justice um, put um, an emphasis in the um, LM um, uh, judgment. Uh, and at the same time, it clearly emerges from your presentation that an important um, element, uh, an important, let's say, um, uh, a difficult aspect in uh, putting in practice the uh, test of the LM judgment is the burden of proof. So the very important burden of proof, which is put on the, uh, uh, on the person seeking to obtain, uh, not to be uh, transferred to the member state um, that issued the, uh, the warrant. And I think that the burden of proof will be one of the uh, topic on which we will focus the most in uh, our uh, workshop in Florence uh, at, at the end of uh, May. Now we uh, move beyond the um, European arrest warrant mechanism and we move to another field in which mutual trust is very important and therefore also this relationship between uh, mutual trust and uh, the uh, rule of law. So our third speaker is uh, Mohor Faitiga from the University of Ljubljana and he will present a very recent judgment of the Administrative uh, Court of Slovenia dealing with pushbacks from Slovenia to Croatia. So Mohor, the floor is yours and you also have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicole. I'll just uh, start to share my screen. Okay, I think it works. Um, I first have to say that I'm honored that uh, I'm able to be here and to present you this very, very interesting case um, of the Slovene Administrative Court concerning pushbacks. Um, I'll just start the presentation. Okay, now it works. Um, so uh, I'll start my presentation with a with a short story. It, it is actually um, very similar to many other stories. It's a story about a um, migrant, about an asylum seeker from Cameroon. Um, he started his journey um, in Velika Kladusha in Bosnia, which is somewhere here. Um, close to Bihać. Then he crossed uh, Croatia and then he came to Slovenia where he was captured by the Slovene police and detained. During the detention, he on multiple occasions said that he wanted uh, to apply for asylum, but actually um, he was ignored. 
And he was then said that he was going to Ljubljana to the migration center where he could apply for asylum. And he was boarded on the bus um, um, at the same time as uh, around 30 other migrants. But the bus didn't go towards Ljubljana, but towards uh, the border with Croatia. There he was handed over to the Croatian police and then Croatian police expulsed him and the other migrants back to Bosnia without issuing any uh, decision, without any formal procedures. So there he was again in Velika Kladusha. And it was actually the second time that this happened to him. Um, and his game, the, that's how the migrants call an attempt to reach EU was uh, unsuccessful. But at the time when um, this um, occurred, um, there were multiple um, reports from NGOs, ombudsmen um, from um, Croatia and Slovenia, from international organizations, um, claiming that um, he was not the only one, that actually this, um, pra these pushbacks are actually a, a common um, practice um, in and that, uh, that Croatian police is actually also um, ex exercising violence towards migrants. And you can, you can Google pictures, uh, horrible pictures uh, all, all over the web. So I, I won't uh, go much uh, more into it. And those reports also testified of uh, really bad uh, conditions in the Bosnian refugee camps. So when he was there at, um, Velika Kladusha in Bosnia, he was really lucky because a group of um, members of a Slovene NGO um, came to, to his place to visit his camp and they met him. He presented uh, his case to them and they decided to bring the case before the administrative court. So here I would like just to pause for, for a moment and say, uh, make a short remark. I think that sometimes we tend to overemphasize the importance of uh, independent judges, uh, which are, of course, of crucial importance. But in cases like this, I think without a vivid uh, civil society that actually brings these cases before courts, the courts can do nothing. So here, uh, there's a, it's um, actually just a great thank you uh, to to a group of young lawyers that took their time, that worked tirelessly um, pro bono uh, to bring this case before the court. Um, and now uh, let me let me get uh, to to the decision. Um, what did the court decide? The court uh, found a few violations of uh, the European Charter of uh, the European um, Char Charter of Fundamental Rights. Excuse me. First, a violation of Article 18, the right to asylum, a violation of Article 19, Paragraph 1, prohibition of collective expulsions, and a violation of Article 19, Paragraph 2, um, the principle of non refoulement The Administrative Court of Slovenia also um, decided that the Slovene government and the Slovene state should allow uh, this applicant to freely enter in the Slovenian territory and apply for asylum. As we don't have time to dig uh, deep into this otherwise very interesting and rich uh, judgment, I'll only stay. Um, uh, I'll only discuss non refoulement uh, connected with the principle of mutual trust, which is uh, the main topic of our today's seminar. Um, so, what did the court decide uh, uh, with regards to this aspect? First, it noted that. Um, this was not a case of return under the um, Dublin procedure, but actually uh, the applicant was returned under a bilateral agreement uh, and under the European Union's um, return directive. But nevertheless, the court said um, the standards um, concerning non refoulement should be the same in, in both cases. Um, however, the court pointed out that um, in principle, uh, mutual trust demands um, that the member state presumes that the other member state 
is actually uh, working, doing everything in compliance with fundamental rights, safe in exceptional circumstances. And which are those exceptional circumstances? This is what we've already discussed today. Uh, this is when there are systemic deficiencies um, in one member state. Um, but now the question is, um, how far should the court go um, into s research to see whether there are some systemic deficiencies? The court, um, the administrative court here explains that when a um, member state cannot be unaware of these systemic deficiencies, it must um, seek um, individual assurances, it must um, do research uh, in order to um, find out whether this individual would be um, subjected to inhuman and degrading treatment, treatment if returned um, to, to another member state. So taking the, um, turning to the, um, case, uh, to the facts of the present case, excuse me, um, the court found that the police did nothing actually. They ignored all the, um, all the um, re reports um, and uh, returned the, the applicant without any formal uh, procedure. Um, and this is, I don't know, I think this is what happens when you um, don't have judges, independent judges, uh, applying the LM test, uh, case, uh, test um, but you have um, police officers and they're dealing with uh, migrants. So unfortunately, um, and the, um, the administrative court found a decision, uh, found a violation of um, procedural aspect of um, non reformant principle. Um, but the Slovene administrative court is not the only court in the region that actually dealt with illegal pushbacks. Um, there were um, already judgments of uh, federal administrative co court of Switzerland and um, tribunal of Genoa, Italy, um, that declared the return under the Dublin regulation to Croatia and um, from Switzerland to Croatia and from Italy to Slovenia uh, to be um, unlawful. Um, but then lately, there, just recently, there has been a, a, a very interesting case um, from uh, Rome. You, ca you, you can see it's um, on uh, 18th of January, just a few days ago. Um, the Rome court decided that pushbacks under the 1996 bilateral, bilateral agreement between Italy and Slovenia are unlawful. This means that actually, if we combine the two judgments, the, the one from, from Rome and the Slovenian judgment, uh, we can see that um, actually the, the pushbacks from Italy to Slovenia and from Slovenia to Croatia are now declared unlawful. So I think we have um, some, um, that we can be positive actually. Uh, especially because also there are too many, uh, two, two new pending cases before the uh, ECHR. Um, one concerns Croatian pushbacks to Serbia and the other one, um, Croatian ill treatment of migrants and pushbacks to Bosnia. Um, so this, I think, begs the question what the EU is doing. Uh, is it really upholding the European values? I think on one hand, it, it is, uh, and this um, is showed by many infringement procedures that were launched against Hungary, asylum and migration cases. Um, but I'm sure that um, my colleagues from Hungary would still say that this is um, too little, too late, if I, if I use the expression um, of Laurent Pesch. Um, but still it's something, I think clearly denouncing um, illegal practices um, is very important. Where, because on the other hand, um, in, uh, in this uh, situation um, of pushbacks um, from Italy to um, Bosnia, um, there has been like um, from 2018 onwards, 
there were accusations of ignorance towards um, towards uh, European Commission, and for now it has not done um, many things. Um, so I think that um, we can conclude that it's this is not upholding um, the European va values um, from the Article Two um, TEU. These are human dignity, freedom, equality, rule of law, respect for human rights, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice and solidarity. Uh, it's really hard to, to say those uh, values in such situations. But uh, we can still be optimistic because in November 2020, the European Ombudsman has opened an inquiry on how Croatian authorities have spent European money they should have spent it on um, establishing a monitoring mechanism that would ensure that um, the processes um, at the border would be compliant with fundamental rights. And as uh, the European Commission is uh, the guardian of the treaty and also the funding, um, it, has, it now has the duty to reply to the Ombudsman um, where this money was this money really uh, used for for this purpose or not um, and um, the reply is due by uh, the end of this month so a lot of interesting things uh, to happen um, so if we take now um, into consideration that uh, we have um, national judgments which are okay they are not final yet um, but still, we have some pending cases before um, the ECHR, and we have the um, inquiry of the European Ombudsman. I think we can be positive. I think and I hope that this game that the migrants are still playing doesn't go on and on, and that the game will be over soon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mar, for your um, presentation. I think that the question that you pose is the European Union upholding its uh, values is a very big question. And it is a question that certainly cannot have sort of black or white uh, answer, as it seems that you um, also um, said. Um, but actually, one of the purposes of the uh, trial project is to um, try to enlighten the added value that the European mechanisms and not of the mechanisms of judicial cooperation between national courts and the Court of Justice and between courts of different member states can have in order to uphold the um, founding values of the Union. So first of all, the rule of law, but as we know, the rule of law is the precondition for upholding also the other values. And thank you also for bringing into the picture uh, other actors in addition to the Court of Justice and National Courts. So the uh, European Court of Human Rights, um, the European Ombudsman and the civil society, because they also have a role indirectly, also in cases before the Court of Justice and in the cooperation between national uh, courts within European mechanisms and particularly the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and the evidence gathered by the um, civil society, by um, uh, ONGs, uh, can be of real support for applicants in order to uh, show the, uh, that the uh, test uh, laid down by the Court of Justice in LM is actually uh, satisfied. So um, thank you uh, very much. Uh, so now I think that we have a few more minutes for maybe a Q&A session and I ask Angelica Lanfranchi who is supporting uh, the logistic of this meeting to put all the participants visible on the screen. So maybe... I'm ready. Give me just a, a little minute too because I do it step by step. Okay, so okay. Promoted. Good, but so... If if it's okay, probably I can. I'm I'm seeing no one now, uh, but I see that there is uh, already at least one hand raised. 
uh, and I see the hand of Maria Vittoria. So maybe Maria Vittoria, if you want to pose your question. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. I, I like break the eyes, okay? <laughs> so I feel like uh, approving this marvelous test and thank you all for your uh, brilliant uh, uh, participation because uh, I, I think that uh, at least in the case of this webinar, which is the peel will that will flourish uh, potentially in the uh, in the transnational training on mutual trust the test is really uh, has really proved to be uh, ideal and uh, exactly the topic of mutual trust in my view gives uh, the possibility uh, to understand how the general principle of uh, the effective judicial protection under article 19 uh, treaty of the function of the european union uh, gives a role, um, uh, plays a role in giving concrete uh, form to the equivalent uh, fundamental right uh, enshrined in Article 47 of the Charter. And uh, this is, of course, the case of the LM case, uh, brilliantly uh, depicted by Alessandra, but uh, is also the case uh, um, uh, represented by uh, Mohor, for example, because uh, all these uh, uh, dynamics are vehiculated by the concept of judicial independence and uh, uh, possibly also as a declination of mutual trust. So I really um, admire your work and uh, thank you all for uh, your brilliant uh, contribution to the project. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Maria Vittoria. Uh, I cannot see the participants, so I cannot see what, okay. Uh, I see that, but from the, from the bar below, I, I, I see that Jan Petrov raised hand. So um, Jan, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jan, I'm a postdoc at the Judicial Studies Institute at Masaryk University. And many thanks to the organizers and to the speakers, uh, this was a great event because I think it's uh, not easy to find uh, information about these national cases which are so relevant for the entire Europe. So it's great we now even have a, a database uh, of these cases as Madalina um, presented. And um, I have uh, an answer for Alessandra and for uh, Marcin and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, so Alessandra described these three cases of the Italian court and um, um, my impression was that the last one, the case from May 2020, uh, was much more stricter since it came after uh, the events which took place in Poland at the beginning of 2020, especially the adoption of the Muzzle Law. And as far as I know, uh, it's not the only national decision um, of uh, this kind being stricter after the Muslim law. I know there was also a decision of, uh, of a Dutch court in Amsterdam and a German court in, in Karlsruhe, which came uh, maybe a few weeks before the Italian decision. So I was wondering whether the uh, Italian court's decision uh, refers not only to the ECJ, but also uh, uh, communicates with these uh, national courts uh, decisions from other countries, because I think then it kind of pretty much broadens the uh, cooperation that we are speaking about. And a uh, question for Marcin. Um, I, I totally agree uh, with you that the LM judgment can be interpreted as a resource provided to the pro-independent uh, national judges, because I can imagine that these questions coming from foreign courts to the national authorities may be problematic, like so many questions asking, are your courts okay? Are your courts independent enough? Uh, but I was wondering, what is the resonance of uh, such questions within the public debate in Poland? Is it something that is debated in the media or civil society, or is it rather something that is beyond the radar of, um, of most of the people? So uh, thank you again, and thank you for any thoughts on this. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, for your questions, but also for your uh, comments. And uh, I don't see additional hands, at least for the moment, but please correct me if I'm uh, wrong, because I see very little 
icons. Uh, so um, since I cannot see additional ants, maybe I ask the panelists if they want to have an immediate reaction to the uh, questions posed by, uh, by Jan. So maybe um, Alessandra and Marcin, I think. Uh, yes, thank, uh, thank you, Jan, for your uh, comments. Um, I think that uh, cooperation with other countries, with other national authorities would be uh, a, a good uh, thing, thing, but I don't think uh, um, uh, it is from the Supreme Court of Cassation, uh, from the Italian Supreme Court of Cassation that we uh, could uh, expect uh, uh, such a cooperation. Because um, in Italy, the Supreme Court of Cassation is, um, is a last is instance uh, jurisdiction, uh, which, um, uh, is, um, uh, which gives uh, judgments only on points of law. So its uh, role is to um, verify, to assess the correctness of the reasoning of the Court of Appeal and to verify if uh, the Court of Appeal is um, um, as um, uh, correctly applied uh, EU law, in, EU law, in, uh, law in general and EU law uh, in particular. And uh, I don't think that uh, um, it is for the uh, Court of Cassation to cooperate with other uh, national authorities, but uh, this is, um, um, I think, an, an, an aspect, an important aspect that could be uh, de developed uh, by the uh, lower courts. So national courts, uh, ordinary courts, or uh, maybe also from the uh, Court of Appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandra. Uh, I simply want to add that in order to uh, increase the cooperation between national courts from different member states, this is something uh, which we uh, which really drives the activity, I think, of the Center of Judicial Cooperation. I think the activity in all the projects that was so lucky to be involved in is the idea that in order to increase this kind of cooperation, we need to have a database like the one that we have, which can provide short summary in English of judgments that can be uh, relevant also from course from uh, other member states. So we always uh, conceived uh, our database as a tool to, to uh, increase uh, national uh, cooperation because language is an important objective uh, barrier to uh, such a uh, cooperation. And then I shut up and maybe um, Martin or more if they want to add something also beyond the uh, questions raised. Yes, uh, of course, I would like to answer Jan's question. I think it's a really good one. But um, if I understand it correctly, uh, uh, yes, the media generally cover these cases very much. But of course, the narrative depends on what media covers the, the information. The public media, they try to emphasize the, that the uh, two stages um, examination means that there is no general, uh, that the tribunal does not recognize any very general problem with the Polish um, judicial system. And as long as this system exists, it means that more or less everything is okay. But uh, from the perspective of independent media, of course, uh, the narrative is more like uh, what we have said today here. So, so it is quite uh, to roughly studied and um, and analyzed. Yes. So it's uh, the answer is that these uh, cases resonate very much, but the narrative very much depends on uh, what media uh, refer to the cases. Thank you, uh, Marcin. Maybe Mohor, do you want to add something? Ah, oh, okay. And then there are some more questions. Now I, was, I saw three hands, but Mohor, if you want to say something now. No, no, I think okay. we should go on. Perfect. So I can see that there are three persons who raised their hands, but I cannot see who. So maybe Angelica, if you can help me. I write to you. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, uh, I think Birgit Aza, and then Yaroslav. 
And then, well, but first, Birgit, please. Hello, and Hi. thank you very much for this interesting project and the introductions of different national systems. As I think you might know, I'm also very much interested in mutual trust as my soon to be defended PhD is about that, but even more interested I'm in your in your database. And I actually wanted to ask um, you as the organizers and compilers of the database, like how, how have you done it? Um, how uh, do you also have, we discussed today criminal and asylum cases. Do you also have civil law cases? Because, you know, I also have a database and I have so much civil law cases. And to be honest, they're even more interesting and more kind of um, uh, paradigmatic in the mutual trust storyline from historically as well. So I was wondering that. And uh, yeah, how do you compile it? Thanks. Okay, I, I think that I will pass this question to um, uh, to Madalina. Um, but I mean, how we did it? Well, it's the fruit of many years, I would say, and many years not spent only on mutual trust and rule of law. Uh, but I think that Madalina maybe can better address your questions. I, I don't have to that, um, it would be a, a, a bad investment. So uh, probably there is someone with the micro on. Um, or maybe because we're running a little bit late, so we have to uh, try to finish in time before the next event that is uh, in program at the Robert Schumann Center. So I'll uh, speak very, very briefly, and then I can chat more with Bridget afterwards so that Yaroslav also can raise the question. Maybe, of course. Uh, Nicole, could we also hear Yaroslav's question and then... Um, so that we make sure that everyone raises their... Yes, questions. of course. So please, Yaroslav, floor is well, yours. It's, it's, it's not a question, actually. It's just a comment of the answer to Jan also, because from my perspective as a former judge and now the activist, so, and I have, you know, the record, the CD records on my background, so I won't uh, sing the blues, but I will say uh, no one cares but, but the judges uh, and but, but the lawyers. And still, uh, all the problems with Polish judiciary are not present in the public debate, first of all. And then probably because we are also lacking a civic education. And it's, I think, the, the, the scene in our Central European countries that it's not very well emphasized, very, not very well taught. So the civic education is lacking. So it's very hard also, you know, it's very hard to uh, translate all those legalese and all those uh, um, justifications and jurisdiction into not only the, the, the plain language, but into the language that is comprehensive for, for, for people. So sometimes, you know, we have just the big things and big uh, events like the March of Thousands Robes, or we have the people in front of courts but there's nothing, also there's nothing behind and there's probably not very much beyond. So there, there's like, like the, the action and only the, the action plan. So that, that's, I, I, that's something that I'm really afraid of. And, but that's my opinion. Thanks a lot. But thank you Yaroslav for sharing with us your precious uh, opinion, I would say. So maybe uh, Madalina, you can say something uh, on the uh, on the database, and then you can uh, go on with a private conversation with uh, with Birgit. But I invite everyone to have a look to the database because it is already uh, online, so you can see whatever is at the moment uh, uh, there. Yes, thank you, Nicole. So as you rightly pointed out at the beginning, the CGC database is not just trial database. It uh, includes case law um, that have been gathered uh, throughout three, four years. Um, and the commonality of all the cases that we have in the database is that they all use in some way uh, the EU charter and they all are an example of judicial interaction among courts. And so mutual trust um, and mutual recognition in civil, criminal, and migration is just one stream of cases that we cover. Um, and the selection of these cases was done basically by national experts from around 10 countries. Um, and in addition to that, we also received voluntary uh, judgments. But 
I have to emphasize that we're always in search of cases. So whoever is willing to share databases, we are very much uh, willing to share them. And we also recognize the author of these templates. As you will see in the database, the authors of each of these case not is uh, recognized there. Sometimes it's a judge or lawyer or, um, or a scholar. Um, and uh, I think this is what I wanted to say. And of, of course, the limitation for the moment is that we only cover cases in English. The judgments, full judgments, is always in the original language. Um, but uh, of course, we would love at some point to have this in more than more languages and not just English. But this is just a, a first step. Um, so thank you, Nicole. Also, thank you, Brigitte, for the question. And please uh, stay in touch with us for, uh, for the database. Thank you very much, Madalina. And I would say that particularly me as the coordinator of the Firenze uni unit in this project, I'm looking for cases concerning rule of law and mutual trust, notably concerning European arrest warrant and asylum, because these will be the, will be the two issues uh, um, that we will discuss in the um, workshop in Florence at the end of May, which will be uh, advertised uh, later on. I think that we can go to the conclusion of this event and probably the last thing that I have to, uh, to do is to um, remember the next appointment, so the two additional um, webinar connected to the trial project. So the next one will be on the 18th of February and the topic should be rule of law, judicial independence and arbitration. Uh, the third and final one, at least for the moment, final one should be on the 18th, will be on the 18th of uh, March and the topic is judicial accountability and freedom of speech. So please take note of these additional events, but cl clearly we will uh, advertise uh, them and keep you posted, okay? So um, have a nice evening and thank you very much for being with us today.